Hello, introductory psychology students. This is Professor Gerding with uh, Sensation Perception. If you're using the OpenStax book, that's chapter five. But let's get through this. Some good news and some bad news. Uh, here's the outline. And we will not be covering hearing, smell, touch, taste, and position, no. But if you're in my class, I'm not gonna put it on the test either. So I'm just gonna test you on the principles of sensation and vision. It's a good time. Principle of, principles of sensation. It's different than perception. Sensation, perception, two different things. We're going to cover that, and then we're just going to talk about the different parts of the eyeball. So, let's do this. But, uh, you guys ever hear of this dress? It caused a whole bunch of controversy based upon what people saw. Was it a black and blue dress? Was it a white and gold dress? Well, you can tell me because look at that picture. It's clear as day, am I right? Am I right? Yeah, it's totally one of those colors. We'll talk about why that controversy happens later. So, principles of sensation. Now, let's get some vocabulary terms out of the way. First of all, I have to describe the difference between sensation and perception. Now, sensation is physical energy acting on a specialized receptor cell. So that would be pressure acting on a nerve cell and that's your touch or maybe it's odors going into your olfactory sensation or maybe it's the sound waves going into your ear that's the physical energy there's actual physical energy but that isn't what your brain understands because your brain doesn't work on pressure it doesn't work on sound waves no it works on neural signal electrical code that's why we have the first vocabulary term that comes into play known as transduction it's the process of transforming that physical energy into neural messages that your brain can make sense of. And perception is your brain's interpretation of it. Here's a great example. How many colors do we sense? How many different bands of light waves? Well, basically, we sense three colors. Red, blue, and green. But, how many colors do we perceive? So many! Am I right? Alright. So, here's some more vocabulary terms that you'll need to know. We already covered transduction, but you need to know absolute threshold. What the heck is absolute threshold? It's the small strength of a stimulus that can be detected half of the time. What does that mean? Well, how do we test how sensitive you are to something? How sensitive is your hearing? How sensitive is your touch? Well, what we do is we give you a sensation and we make it lighter and lighter, weaker and weaker, until you can just barely detect it. And how do we know when you can just barely detect it? Because half of the time, you're not detecting it at all. So imagine I have this sound, beep, and we make it quieter, beep, and quieter, beep, and quieter. And eventually, you'll say, oh, I can hear that. And if you can only hear it about half the time, you've reached your absolute threshold. Here's the way I remember it. If I were to take some vodka and do a shot of vodka, I'd be like, oh man, that vodka is strong. But then if I were to water it down, let's suppose I mix it with water, I'd say, yeah, I can still taste the vodka. And then I water that absolute vodka down even more. Once I water it down to the point where I'm only tasting it about half of the time, well, that absolute vodka has reached the absolute threshold. The next vocabulary term is the difference threshold, also known as the JND, which stands for the just noticeable difference. This is the smallest difference that can be detected between similar sensations. So let's suppose we're doing a sound test once more. You're wearing your headphones and I have one sound in one ear and maybe another sound in the other ear and they slowly change pitches. At first they sound the same, beep, beep, but eventually one changes pitch to the point where it goes beep. Once you can hear the difference, once we're slowly making these changes and you can hear the difference, it's reached its difference threshold. It's the same thing with brightness. Imagine you're looking at two light bulbs and one of those light bulbs slowly gets brighter. Well, once you can say, whoa, hold on, that light bulb over there is brighter than that light bulb, well then it's reached its difference threshold, also known as its just noticeable difference. 
And then there's sensory adaptation. Thank goodness. This is the decline in sensitivity to a constant stimulus. For instance, I'm sure you've walked into someone's home that smells like they own 17 too many cats. And you ask yourself, how do they live like this? How can they live with that smell? Well, it's because of sensory adaptation. Because the scary thing is, if you're sitting in that house for a little bit, it doesn't smell as bad as it first did. This is why some people reek of cologne or perfume. They put it on, I'm gonna smell so good. But then they think, oh no, it wore off. But it didn't wear off. It was sensory adaptation. So what do they do? They put more on. They think, oh man, it wore off again. It didn't wear off. Sensory adaptation. So what do they do? They put more on again. And by the time they meet you, it's like they hit you in the face. Like with a punch, a perfume punch. Anyway, that's sensory adaptation. But now let's talk about vision. What's the purpose of the visual system? Well, to see, silly. So I have other things written on here. But realistically, all that means is we have eyeballs so that we can see the world. And there's fancy ways of saying that, but that's what it means. So, how do we see color? This is pretty amazing. There's a whole bunch of different types of light waves throughout the world. There's radio waves, television waves, microwave, x-rays. Those are all actually light waves, but we don't see those light waves. We only have a little bit of visible light that we can see. And on average, that's between 700 nanometers and 400 nanometers of wavelength. That's a billionth of a meter, it's really small. But here's what's really fascinating. The wavelength of a light wave is what depicts its color. So for instance, if I'm seeing a light wave that's around 500 nanometers in length, what color am I seeing? It's like green. But if I'm seeing 600 nanometers, I'm seeing yellow. And this is what this is depicting, right? So just think about all those light waves out there that we can't visually see. And then the ones we do see, it depends on the wavelength. And that's what gives us the color right? So light can be described both as a particle and a wave. It's definitely energy, hence solar panels that absorb light waves and then power so much of our electronics. So everything on this slide is what I just told you. Wavelength of light is related to its perceived color. Again, 400 to 700 nanometers. Now, if you're in my class and you're going to take a test, I'm not going to ask you what's the average length of waves that the human can perceive. So don't worry too much about that. But what we really do need to know is just the basic fact that it's the wavelength that relates to the perceived color. So here we go, the bread and butter of it all, the parts of the eye. Here's what I want you to know for the test. And more than this, the cornea, the pupil, the iris, the lens. So how do I explain these things? Well, imagine if I were to go ahead and take a piece of corn and I were to flick it at your eyeball. Well, the good thing is, it wouldn't just go inside of your eye because your eye has a protective covering around it, this clear transparent membrane. That clear transparent membrane that protects the eye and helps gather and direct incoming light is known as the cornea. That was like my way of tricking you into remembering it. I flick a piece of corn into your cornea. Anyway, so you go, ah, damn it, in my eye. Good thing I had that cornea so it didn't do too much damage. Next is the pupil. That's the actual hole in the eye, that black dot. A lot of people are surprised when they find out that their eye is actually a hollow structure. It's filled with stuff, but that's an opening into the eye. It's not just a black dot. That's why when the eye doctor gets their flashlight, they annoy the crap out of you by shining it right into your pupil. They're looking at the insides of your eyeball. Then there's the iris. Oh. That's the beautiful colored part of the eye. Usually when someone says you have beautiful eyes, what they really mean is, hey, I really like the color of your iris. So it's pretty easy for me to remember because I, my wife hates it when I tell this story. I remember the closest thing I had to love at first sight. It was this woman who had these beautiful glow in the dark blue eyes. I can't even explain how blue they were, it was crazy. And her name was Iris. So it just makes sense for me, easy to remember. Now lens, is something that you can't see from the outside. Lens is when we go to the inside of the eye. And here's how I remember it. It rhymes with bends because the lens bends. Why does the lens bend? Well, this is this transparent structure that bends to help focus light waves onto your fovea, which is part of your retina. Now, I just mentioned two vocabulary terms that are gonna be covered coming up. So the lens bends to help you accommodate light waves it basically is what makes you focus on things. So if you look at your fingertip, 
it looks very clear. You can see all the details, the little swirls. That's because the lens is bending. Let's take a look. Woo, here we go. Look at all these different structures. Here, I'll show you the lens. The lens is right here. This beautiful clear part, as you can see, that's being depicted there. And that's what actually bends. And the point of it is it's trying to aim the light waves into the fovea. So what the heck's the fovea? the retina, we have optic disc here as well and optic nerves, but I just really want to focus, if you will, on the retina and the fovea. The fovea is part of the retina and the fovea has the highest visual acuity. Again, let's do this little experiment. Look at your fingertip if you're listening to me and notice all that fine spatial detail that you see, those little swirls, maybe your fingers are dirty and you should wash your hands, but notice how everything else looks in the background. It's blurry as all hell. Why is that? Because the light waves of your fingertip are hitting your fovea, but all the other light waves are just hitting the retina. So whatever's in the fovea helps you focus very clear, fine spatial detail, and the rest of it just sees blurry, but at least it can see. So that's the difference between focusing on something and not focusing on something, if it's hitting the retina or the fovea. So here is these two parts of the eye defined for you. Again, fovea is a small area in the center of the retina composed entirely of cones. What the hell are cones? I'm going to cover that in the next two minutes because we have two different types of sensory receptors, photoreceptors, if you will, the rods and cones. But the fovea has the cones, which helps you see fine spatial detail. Then there's the retina, which is the rest of the membrane located in the back of the eye. Maybe you've heard of boxers having a detached retina. That means they got punched in the eyeball so hard that the actual back lining of the eyeball is starting to peel off. So let's talk about the cones and the rods. Cones and rods get their names because of the shape. You'll never guess what cones are shaped like. Yeah, cones. You'll never guess what rods are shaped like. Yeah, rods, cylinders, right? But here's the thing. Cones help us see colors and rods don't see color. But rods don't require a lot of light to work, and cones do require a lot of light to work. So you'll notice that if cones help us see color, and there's not a lot of light in a room, you walk into a dark room, what does it look like? Yeah, there's no colors there, because your cones can't work. That's where your rods come in. So remember, your fovea is full of these cones, which see colors, but the more like there is, the more vivid these colors will be. That means in the peripheral edges of your eye, outside of the fovea, in the rest of your retina, is mostly rods, which helps us see dim light, doesn't really help us see fine spatial detail, but helps us see in the dark. This is a pro tip I'm about to give you, because if you want to look for something in the dark, you want to use your peripheral vision, the rods on the outside. So the worst thing you can do, if you're like looking for your keys in a dark room and you don't want to turn on the light because you don't want to disturb whoever's sleeping, I'm not judging, but you don't want to look directly at the keys. Use the side of your vision. Try it. It really works. You can see in the dark better through your peripheral vision, your side vision. Here's a little tip that I going to give you to help you remember the difference between rods and cones. Whenever I think of cones, I think of something delicious. I think of ice cream. Yes, ice cream. And think of all the different flavors of ice cream and how they come with all the different colors. Yes, there's so many different colors, colors of ice creams. It's delicious. It makes me salivate just thinking about it. But rods, rods, I think of a rod that helps me see in the dark and that would be my flashlight. That thing's a cylinder. Put the batteries in. Now I can see in the dark. Rods help you see in the dark, but don't help see color. So cones versus rods. Hopefully that helps you remember. A little pro tip from Professor G. So here, just more information, which I already told you. Cones concentrated in the fovea of the eye. And the rods are in the peripheral ed edges of the eye. Hence why you can see in the dark using your peripheral vision better. And color vision has to do with our cones, as we've talked about. But here's what's amazing. We only have three different types of cones, each of which detects a different wavelength range of light waves, which is just a fancy way of saying that our cones only see three colors. Those three colors are red, blue, and green. That's right. So let's talk about color blindness then. How is it that some people are colorblind? Well, the most common color blindness is red, green, colorblind. Why is that? Because instead of having a trichromatic cone system, meaning they have three different cones, they have a bichromatic. They only have two. They have a cone, which 
detects blue, but then instead of having a cone that detects red and a cone that detects green, they have one big ass cone that detects red and green. So they have a hard time distinguishing between red and green, and that's the most common. There's also blue yellow color blindness. There's also black and white color blindness, which is insanely rare. You want to know how a colorblind person sees the world? Look at this picture. It looks pretty, right? What are the two most prominent colors here? Red and green. And what are the two colors that most colorblind individuals have difficulty distinguishing? Red and green. So here's how a colorblind person sees this. Yeah. Think of that. Colors. They're beautiful. Colorblindness. But now we get back to this the sensation perception and color constancy. What about this dress? Why is it that so many people are divided? Because you either see it as black and blue, you see it as white and gold, or some people see it as both. But the question is why? Why? Well, it has to do with color constancy. And there's actually a video to help us take a look at this. All right, so the world's divided on this dress. You are either on team black and blue, or you're on team white and gold. On Twitter, social media, whole bunch of different fights and responses. But for what it's worth, I saw black and blue, and at one time I saw it as white and gold for a little bit. How's this possible? Let's talk about it. It's known as color constancy. Look at this cube. That square looks brown, that one looks orange. But guess what? They're the same color. I promise this isn't trick photography. The way it works is your brain interprets things differently. It sees the shadow down there and thinks, oh, that brown square is darker because shadows make it darker. We have to lighten that brown and make it orange. But if we take the shadow away, you see they're both brown. Pretty amazing. Same thing with the dress. The context of this dress is very ambiguous. You can't see anything outside of the dress. Is it indoor? Is it outdoor? It depends on your perception. If you see it as white and gold, you probably see it as a blue lit room, like a blue sky outside, and therefore your brain adapts for the blue, and therefore you see white and gold. But if you see it as black and blue, you see it as in artificially lit setting with yellow lights, like indoors. So then the gold is taken away. And this is how your brain compensates. This is color constancy. This image is just perfectly ambiguous. It all depends on where you saw the image the first time. I hate to say this, but in actuality, the dress is black and blue, because here's some more pictures. This is just a great example of how our brains have evolved to understand color constancy and color's perception. This is the website which I got this video. Check it out. They do a better job than I did. <laughs> this dress is just one of those bizarre examples of the difference between sensation and perception. Really cool stuff. And I hope you enjoyed that because this was the chapter all about sensation and perception. We talked about the difference between sensation and perception and that's actually what we ended on as well. Gave you some vocabulary terms like transduction, uh, absolute threshold, difference threshold, and then we talked about the different parts of the eye. The beautiful retina, oh, the protective cornea, but you would not hit in my eye corn. And we talked about the hole in the eye, the pupil, and we talked about the difference between rods and cones. Which one helps you see colors? Cones. Which one helps you see in the dark? Rods. Yeah, thanks so much for listening. Hey, I'm Professor Gertie, you can call me Professor G, and thanks for watching this video, and I hope to see you in the classroom. <laughs> Bye.